Close There's it. just a bunch of coffee beans. I don't even drink coffee, but. Yeah. All right, all right. Yeah, so the uh, the girl that owns the hangar, uh-huh. um, she has like a coffee business called Hustle Hub. And she sources them through Venezuela, and then she stashes them here. And then she distributes them across the valley. So you got endless supplies of coffee if you boys need. Yeah, if if <laughs> if uh, same thing for me. I don't drink coffee, I, uh-huh. I, um, but my girl loves coffee, and it's yeah. it's a perk. I got you free coffee, honey. Yep. We're rolling, right? That's how we do it on the pod. That's rolling. Welcome back to the podcast, guys. Uh, let's be honest. This is the coolest podcast set we've been in. Coffee beans behind me. Your jet behind you. <laughs> yeah. Ricky, welcome to the podcast, brother. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. So we were just chatting off camera. I think I want to share that. Um, let's do it. I want to talk about, well, we'll talk about the numbers, but let's let's go back to talk about the day that you're like, like wh- what day did you decide, I'm going to get a jet? So... Or how did that come about? Yeah, it didn't come about that way. And it kind of came across um, almost in every way of, on why I decided to, like, get into real estate. Um, my big thing is when I first got into real estate, it started because I was, I, as in, like, actually investing in real estate beyond just, like, my primary residence. Um, there's a guy named Lenny. He's a real estate agent. Uh, he's under real estate executives. He's, like, my mentor and my business partner's mentor, um, pretty much in house flipping. I used to fund hard money loans for him. Mm-hmm. So the way that I became aware of what house flipping is and what it could be, uh, to, to learn even the very basics as I understood what the concept was, I just didn't know how people did it, right? How do you find something lower than what it sells for market value? How do you renovate it? Why is it selling for more? Um, he pretty much, as I began doing hard money loans for him, I earned an interest and I pretty much just began to shadow him. Uh, The same concept with that of how I became aware of how house flipping works and now, um, you know, we flip houses. It was the same thing for the planes. So the JR Garage Brothers um, started like their aviation um, YouTube channel. And I saw that they were buying planes, but prop planes. And they came to me and they're like, hey, uh, we wanted to know if we can borrow like $110,000 or $112,000. We have this like Cessna Citation 172, I think it was. Um, I was like, okay, well, I know nothing about this. I was like, explain to me what it's worth, what you plan to sell it for, and what my take-home is. Uh, We originally did an interest-based loan, but they put up collateral. They put up, uh, I think, two Lamborghinis. They gave me the titles for two of their Lamborghinis. So because I was very unaware of the risk that comes with lending for a plane, I literally know nothing about it. I'm excited to talk to you about it because I I think a lot of people would be surprised on how different it is from buying a car or buying yeah. a house. Um, but as I became more aware of, I, I did two loans for them, one for a Cessna um, and then one for a um, series. It's like the one that I posted once with the doors go up. Uh, and that mm-hmm. one f- was for like 115 or 120,000. And it's got interest off of it. I became aware of it. And by the end of 2022, um, it, it was just an idea of like, hey, if you guys find a good deal on a jet, I'll entertain it. Two weeks later, they call me and be like, I think we found a jet and it's in North Carolina. I grew up in California. I live in Arizona. I've never been to North Carolina. And um, they explain to me, they break down the numbers. They show me comps just like we do with real estate. Um, and, you know, I think in about a week and a half, we uh, flew out over there. We negotiated once again. We sent the wire. He got it. We flew it from Northern California. Uh, North, Northern, uh, from North Carolina back to Arizona. It was the, cra- I've never been in a private jet prior to that. Yep. So um, it was just like a crazy experience on, on how it all started. It all starts just because, again, I wanted to entertain the idea of investing or, or lending in a specific market that I wanted to learn more about. Super interesting. So, so when you're buying a plane, I imagine it's in the middle of buying a house versus a car? Or like nope. what's, the, what's the inspection process and, and all that sort of stuff look like, paperwork? So paperwork, this is the part that baffles me. First off, did you know that it is not required by law to insure your plane? 
No, I didn't know because I don't own a jet yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, there's like that. I didn't uh, know that. There's that prop plane, and that prop plane originally sold for forty five thousand uh, dollars, but now is worth about seventy five thousand. I mean, th- with any wow. plane. But the thing that just baffles me is that these tin cans that are flying above us, unless they're commercial flights, obviously, some of them could be uninsured, and that was just wow. insane to me. Um, I, I learned about the price per gallon. We talked a little bit about that, right? So you guys can try to share it down in the comments section even before I say it. What do you think the price per gallon is for a jet or jet fuel, right? Because prop planes and jets take the same gas, right? Um, and I was so caught off guard when I was like, at that time, jet fuel was cheaper than gas at the pump for <laughs> premium. And that was insane to me. I mean, yeah. I think we paid like uh, four thirty-eight exactly, it's four dollars and thirty-eight cents per gallon. Obviously, it takes a buttload of you know gallons to fill up the the, mm-hmm. the wings, right? That's where you actually put the gas. I don't know if you knew that. Do you know what the number is like? To how fill many it gallons? I know you're saying it's like pounds, but like I think it's equivalent, equivalent to right under five hundred. 500 pounds or 500 gallons. So I'm never the so one it's that like actually... like 2,000... It's like around two to $3,000. And that lets you fly for... We could have, if, if wind, if headwind was not going against us, we could have done it without needing to stop, to my understanding of what I understood from the right, pilot. Right, because going towards like New York from Arizona... You're going with it. Yeah, I just flew to Miami the other day. It was like three hours, 57, and then it was four hours and 37 back. Yep. And yeah. then you, f- you know, again having no experience ever being in a jet and then experiencing this, the smallest, cheapest, oldest jet you could buy. And then we flew it from North Carolina to Arizona, the turbulence, the takeoffs, the landings. It, we were under like, we had to like change where we were going to land and fuel up because there was a storm hitting Dallas. It was Mm -hmm. just, it was, it was, I was definitely very worried. I, I uh, called, my insurance agent and I upped my life policy. Yeah. Uh, right before I got, I'm not joking, dude. I was that <laughs> concerned. And then you get on and then it starts going up and it's, I, I, everything's yep, bouncing. I was just You're like, like it's over. This is it. This is like, th- I have no control over this. I don't know how to fly. Um, but it was, it was a crazy experience in that sense. So, um, what was the exact question that you asked me in the beginning? Well, just like the, the, the buying process. I mean, you have inspections yeah. like a house, I imagine, What's the paperwork look like? How much more than, say, buying a car? So, you know, when you buy a car private party, they just hand you the title if they own yep. it outright. It was the same idea with who we bought it from. He didn't have any loans from it. We didn't take out a loan. Mm-hmm. So we just sent the wire. He said, okay. And this is the part that baffles me, is that all that, like, was required was the previous owner wrote a bill of sale and mailed it to the FAA. And if you know anything about the FAA, they're backed up six to eight weeks. And then they will reach out to me, letting them know, letting me know that they received it. And then I submit my paperwork and that's it. And then they just wow. put me as I'm the owner. But as of, uh, as like that, I walked away with a title like I would with a car or like I have a deed for a house. There's none of that. Hmm. So could I have gotten someone if I bought it through a dealer or through a middleman um, that probably would have had me get an inspection and stuff like that? Of course, right? Just like when you buy a supercar, you have the option of either doing it or not doing it. But when you buy it, buy it private party and there's no lenders, there's no middleman, it's just direct to seller. Um, at least from my experience, I literally sat down when we got to the their hangar in North Carolina. I sent the wire. The owner wasn't even there. There was just the guy that like pretty much runs that big old hanger and he was like okay he got the wire you guys are good to go and we took off see ya and he gave us a spare tire for the for the jet that was like like 1500 (laughs) here's the spare chips yeah (laughs) it it was just he was like oh yeah i like i i I bought another one that he had another jet coming so he had to get rid of this one well it's funny because you keep saying oh it's an old but it's like it, it looks like it's in great condition. I mean, it's a beautiful jet. I love it. The way that I, you know, I, I have posted on social media. I try to post when I post either my cars or stuff like that. I've always been like trying to encourage people of like, oh, I bought the cheapest because I, I never like the idea of needing to overpay or feeling the need to overpay. Uh, so when I film these videos, I'm like, oh, I bought the cheapest or I bought the oldest. It's because I don't want it to come off of as, as in like, 
Like, I bought a jet, or I think that it's super cool. Right. I think it's super cool. I think it's like if I'm, like, 16 or 18, and I have a 1987 Honda Civic, and it's my first car, and to other people, it might be it might be like a absolute POS. But to me, it is my pride and joy. And that's what I yeah. would say this is to me. Although it is old, although it is, some people might not feel comfortable in it, right? For me, it's like, it's a huge milestone, and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm very happy about it. And you're you're looking at this from a investment perspective. You got a hell of a deal on it. Uh-huh. And from a, you said you already looked at the comps. So, you know, already, do you think you could sell it today and make a, a good good little profit? We've had offers above what we paid already. Yeah. And you've had it for how long? I've had it since. Chips, remind me, was it December twelfth? I think it was December twelfth. Oh, so you've had it less than a quarter. Oh wow. yeah. So I plan to keep it by the middle to the end of this year. Mm-hmm. And then I want to buy, the goal would be a citation too, which is a little bit bigger than this one. Yeah. And then you start stacking. You just keep building up. I I would love to. That's yeah. amazing. So I, I obviously am not trying to deviate from the jet conversation, but I had a few specific questions. And, and really this podcast isn't really, it's not that we don't care about your backstory, but yeah. we try to just go in. Because it's it. like, the second thing I've seen you doing lately is you got a GTR. I do. Yep. But But. you're giving it away. Yes. So I, first of all, it's cool. Yep. But I want to know the behind, because you're doing everything for a reason. So I want to know how do, first of all, how do you determine who is in a drawing to win a GTR? How does that work? What do they have to do? So the way that you enter this giveaway is we, first off, we have a third party sweepstakes company. We wanted to run it as legit. I mean, we've given away laptops and stuff like that. Mm Mm-hmm. But with those, if they're under $3,500, we don't have to get a third party involved. So we hired a third party sweepstakes company. They pull everyone that enters. There's two ways to enter. Um, you can buy merch from Shop Tech Buds. Mm-hmm. For every $1 you spend, it equals five entries. Or you can sign up for LPP, and then that will earn you 5,000 entries. So those are the Got two it. ways to enter. Uh, there's also a free way. You can do mail in ballots. We have to talk about that because that's the third way. So. <laughs> You, you do. That's what they taught, told us. Um, <laughs> Mail-in ballots? Well, I'm some, oh, I don't know if they like that. But, no, it is, right, Chips? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, Chips is handling the ballots. No, no. So, again, <laughs> the third-party sweepstakes company uh, were registered under all 50 states, to my understanding. And then I think Canada is included, but not Quebec. Something okay. like that. Um, and they handle everything. So, we have, to, we have to pay them. We had to pay for a bond to ensure that if the winner, whoever wins, they get something. Because we're doing a GTR or $50,000 cash. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty much like insurance for whoever enters that they're getting something, either a GTR or $50,000. So it's been a really cool experience. So to learn a little bit more about the back end, um, was there like a lot of due diligence done uh, on my side of like, hey, I think that, you know, this is why we should do it? No, it was very, like we've never big been big on running ads um, for how big our our business is I run about two to maybe three thousand dollars a month on retargeting ads that's all that's all you do that's all we ever have done so wow. we wanted to try to spend more money on ads but then I was like wait or we can try a different approach give something away and let the people that follow us, be more willing or more like let them kind of do the legwork where they, they promote us and stuff like mm-hmm. that. So I can either pour seventy to eighty thousand dollars in ads or I can try to do it and give the power to the people, incentivize yeah, one person and see if the turnout the turnaround would be even better, right? The overall experience might be better that way. And it's and it's something that we've never done. It's we are paying for a a group of people that um, pretty much consultants that have done giveaways like this before. So I'm trying to cover my, um, like we're trying to make sure we understand what we're doing and that we're doing it strategically. Um, but did I? Like, well, that's what the question was. I was like, how do you sit down and say, this is going to be give me an ROI? First, no, you first off, didn't. when I went to go buy the GTR, none of, no one in our company, my business partner didn't even know that I was going to go buy it. And then I bought yeah. the GTR because it was a really good deal. Yeah. Um, and I knew I could resell it. And then I was like, ah, oh, I don't know if I want to resell it. I was like, this is my fifth G2R that I've had, and I buy and resell them right pretty often. I used to do it all the time. And I was like, do I want to keep it? I have six cars right now. And I was like, no. I was like, let's 
So as I was driving back from the dealership, I said, I'm going to give it away. And for me, that was just for me to put it out there that there was no going back. And then after I messaged our team and I was like, hey, we're giving away a GTR and we're going to figure out how to make this work. That's Did, all. Does anybody respond like you're crazy? Uh, n- no, th- everyone was like, what the hell? Like, damn, that's a dope GTR. <laughs> um, but no, it's because my thing was like, we didn't need to give it away. We knew that it would be a fun project, a fun experience, and it's going to challenge us. And we're going to learn so much along the way that, like, I, n- I know we're going to make money off of it. But that's not really my concern. I know we have the team, and I know we have the presence for it. My thing was just, like, I wanted to push our entire team to, mm-hmm. to like, feel a little uncomfortable. And all of us, we had to hire new people. Um, it's already taken us, and we've already learned so much more in a – such shorter period of time than I feel like we would have if we would have just been like, okay, well, let's try to spend, you know, double the amount of ads that we are right now. Right. Right. So how much longer from, obviously, filming when they watch this might be over, but how much longer, when when are you doing it? So the giveaway started March 3rd, 2023, Uh and it's been ran for 90 days. So normally giveaways are maybe ran for around 60 days. I, we had a discussion about this in our Monday meeting and then my business partner was like, maybe we should just run it for like two months. I was like, we don't have to run this giveaway. I was like, we're doing it because we want to. Yeah. I was like, if I want to run it for 90 days, shoot, if I want to run it for one year, who's going to tell me I can't, right? Well, as long as it's like, okay, right, according to the sweepstakes company, but it is. There, there is no limited time. My thing was I wanted to give us enough time to make sure that I know mistakes are going to be made along the way, that we cover our ground. And I think that's what's – so when we when we choose to do something like this that's new, I try to do it in a way that I take some form of risk management into consideration. And time is often, based off of what we learned from the people that are consulting us, time is always going to be like one of the biggest determining factors in yeah. building urgency and or if payment processors shut you down or something like that. that. That's what we've learned. So giving us extra time will only do us more good than bad. So... I guess from call it late February to March 3rd, did you guys already notice an uptick in call it merchandise purchases or um, learn brand what LPP learn LPP uh, not so much, um, but from apparel, just the the because someone can literally buy a T-shirt. We've had people just right. shop like for a thirty dollar mouse pad because they like it. We've ran other giveaways and they win an iPad and like I didn't even know I was entering. So. Has there been more awareness about this giveaway? I mean, yes. Like, um, people were asking, when does it start? When does it start? People thought it already started. We made it very clear it starts in early March. So then once we actually launched, in the first three days, we already had our biggest month for apparel. Okay. So So there you go. That answered the question, I think. For that one. For LPP, uh, because the paywall is much higher, right, where with apparel you can buy a $30 mouse pad, and with LPP it's... Uh, starts at 4.99, but normally we give a discount, which ends up being 3.50. Um, you know, my th- my thing was more of like I wanted to learn how to effectively ru- effectively run ads on the paid side, not just through our organic traffic, because that's all apparel ever was on the paid side to be able to drive traffic to apparel. My goal would be to have apparel become its own thing, where it doesn't have to be dependent on my influence. Yeah. Wow. So I oftentimes think I've got too much going on, and then I listen to this. So what are your main sources of income right now that yeah. you can think of? So I have LPP, right? Mm-hmm. I also I trade live every morning, so my live sessions. I have YouTube. If we're counting everything, I have YouTube. Um, I have rental properties. I have the house flipping partnership that I have with Nick Palladino. Um, what else do we have? We have uh, the e-commerce brand. I'm an investor for... Um, used car dealership named Karsten Moore Auto Group. Um, and I believe that's it. And then just the little hard money loans that I do off to the side. Yeah. So how do you stack that up? Like, what, what did, how did you get started? I'm kind of interested. Like, what, what motivated you to... So everything is... The only reason I'm able to do all of this, and people, I mean, you know, like, people think that it, yeah, it maybe sounds like a lot, but I have partners. I have yeah. partners, and, and they d- I delegate all of the work. So I am the face of almost every part of the company, but I don't do all of 
like the legwork necessarily. Mm -hmm. So I have a specific role, and my role is supposed to complement my partner's. If we both have the same role, then we won't have a partnership that actually works or thrives. And I think that's why almost every business, almost every business that I've started, I've always had that focus. Where if we're both supposed to be doing the same thing, it will never work. Yeah. But if I have someone, like for like the trading side of things, no one else does that but me within our group. And I go live every morning and that is my main job. When it comes down to the e-commerce, that's Jake's main job. We have meetings and we work together, but he knows that he is running pretty much everything on the back end. Nick Palladino, just like I I posted a reel yesterday um, for all of our house slips. I think we did a little bit over 30 house slips last year and over 90% of them were all sourced through my social media. Wow. And Meaning, meaning you're posting saying, hey, I'm buying houses. Do you, what deals do you have? Yeah. Um, yeah, and I incentivize the people that reach out to me. Be like, we pay you either a flat rate finder's fee, so a couple thousand dollars, or if you take the risk with us in the sense of if you don't ask for anything up front, we'll give you a percentage of the net profits. Mm. And um, 90% of the deals that we did were all from social media. Wow. And when it comes down to Carson Moore, I have Caleb and Weston, who I'm just the investor behind it but they are the ones running the show. So there's a used car dealership in the Mesa location, and then there's two in Arkansas, one in Searcy, Arkansas, and one in BB, Arkansas. Wow. And they're running the show there. So what start? What was the first thing you started doing? Trading? Trading, or yeah. Trading. So trading is what pretty much, like, got me started in, like, these, like, side hustles type of things. Uh, my first video of, like, what built awareness was back in 2015. Uh, I was trading. I was going to school. I went to ASU Polytechnic. Um, I was 20 years old at the time. I just moved from California to Arizona and I was uploading a video on Black Friday, the day before Black Friday, because I've, I worked at Verizon Wireless and I worked in telecommunication sales. So I'm really big on uh, commission based jobs. I've always been on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe like, uh, solili- sol- Solfinity, yeah. Solfinity is commission based, right? Yep. And it's not based off of just hours that you work, but there's an incentive beyond that. And, and everyone that works within our company um, has some type of offer that like that, where mm-hmm. we pay you an hourly, but on top of that, we incentivize you based off of the value that you bring. I always feel like that always motivated me to work harder. Yep. Um, so I worked at Verizon. I got pre-qualified to buy my first house, and I uh, was closing on December 23rd of 2015. And I, had to, I couldn't go home for Thanksgiving because I worked the next day in phone sales, right? Right. Um, and I filmed this video of like, hey, I'm buying my first house. I got an FHA loan. Um, I'm buying it for $176,000. And my name is Ricky. I go to ASU. I, uh, really? And the video is still up. Yeah. Really? Yeah. It was that was your first, first YouTube video? Yeah. Yeah. And like, it, it gained traction? No, or no, no, not no, at no, all. No. no one cared. No, I, I uploaded it. No one cared. I uploaded videos about like um, different cars that I was into. No one cared. I was always a big car guy. And then I uploaded a video where I was into um, like a, a lower, I was trading a lower cap stock and I made like $110, $113 off of it. Mm-hmm. And then that video got over 100,000 views. Wow. And it got a bunch of comments where people were asking me like, what indicators are you using? And then I made videos on that. And then people were asking me, well, what platform do you use? And I made videos on that. Every video that I began making was solely based off of feedback for the people that were yeah. tuning on in and asking me questions. Those are the ones that I was trying to be of value for. And one thing leading to another, I began uploading one video a w- like a week, one video a day. And then I began uploading for about a year and a half, two videos every single day, not including my two videos a day on YouTube. Yeah. Oh God. Jason's been trying to get me to do like one a week if I can. Well, <laughs> right. But it's two a day. Now, now when we talk about how many videos we upload or pieces of content are shared through our different outlets, I think now people would think that's overwhelming. So mm-hmm. I upload two videos still now every single day, one shortly after the market opens and after my live trading, and then one around 4 to 5 p.m. Arizona time. Before that, I go live for about 30 minutes to an hour and a half with my Learn Plan Profit Group, and that's a private live session. On top of that, we upload two reels Every single day on TechBot Solutions, we upload one reel on Ricky Gutierrez, and we upload one reel and one picture on TechBot's apparel. We upload two TikToks, and we upload one short every day. Wow. What's that team look like? How many editors, 
schedulers. One editor and one filmer. We just, so like we did it like a week or a week Get and a half work. ago. I sit here. Get to work, Jason. Well, no, I, the thing is, it's like, it, it's, it has to be like a, a two-way thing, right? Yeah. Because the thing that I really like about how they set it up for me is they have topics for me to talk about. But on top of that, I'm supposed to provide also ideas that I think that are relevant mm -hmm. to the conversation. So about 30 videos are filmed every single time that we meet up. And then those 30 videos for the next week are distributed through the different social media outlets. On top of that, then I have my two videos that I have to film on YouTube every day. And then my daily live trading session that I upload and that I go live with every single day at Market Open, Monday through Friday. Very interesting. So, so how much effort do you put into, like, the research process? Um, tagging, that. titling, thumbnails, or do you put very little into that at this point? No, not... not Because you're at, like, a, over a million subs now? 1.1, 1. 1. yeah. But the videos that have always done best for us is... I, I film... I upload very boring videos. So it's about economic reports. I mean, you know what yeah. it is. Um uh, today I live streamed for about two and a half hours for Jerome Powell's testimony in front of Congress. Like we had at one point six thousand people live, and that was really cool. And those are the people that I engage with. And if you know anything about our right for the people that are watching, you know that if I have six thousand people live, they're interested in what I'm doing. Like those are super valuable people, right? Yep. So I'm just trying to provide the most value to them while I have them live. Um, but the videos that like go viral are my day in life videos. Like like mm -hmm. I call them like hustle porn videos. Uh, hustle I, porn yeah they're like kind of like the lifestyle i i don't really like filming those necessarily anymore but anytime i upload one of those always just a million views yeah um, and well i think the way that you've approached it it you can post cool things without coming across as a jackass i completely agree which yeah has always been something that even i've you know i have in paradise valley a very cool flip i'm a part of and like i saw it's like you know, you could come across as an ignorant. Yeah. You know, when it's done, it's going to be like, screw you, kid. Yeah. Like, when it's done, it's going to be the biggest infinity pool in the state of Arizona, you know. Um, and then, like, you know, other little things. But, like, you do it in a way where it's always tying back education, which I think that's the difference. Definitely. Than just saying, oh, I bought a jet. Yeah. You know. Definitely. Um, so so from, a, from a YouTube perspective, what would you say is, like, the more important? Is it consistency and frequency of just staying on top of it or is it uh because i i interviewed sebastian georgiou yeah i'm sure you know yep and i can't remember what he said but it was something so he was like well if they're not getting views then that means that they're not good enough and he was like you just have to make good content and he like laughed and he's like i know that sounds simple but you got to he was kind of framing it that Mr. Beast has made all of our attention span so short because every second of his videos are so, like, articulated yeah. that he needs to put so much more effort. Now, I'm not saying uh, – what I'm saying is your strategy and his strategy seem completely different because he's like, dude, we prepare for weeks sometimes for one video. Yeah. Whereas you're like, oh, I do two a day and I just talk. So it's, like, interesting to consider – I think he's almost to a million. You're a little over a million. I mean, you're around the same size in terms of a channel with two vastly different strategies. Yeah, so I've seen if both approaches work because I, I've seen people even beyond that on TikTok blow up and they have now over 5 million, right? And then after you hit 5 million or over a million on TikTok, then you become relevant on almost every other platform. Um, I would say that I really like, like, like Sebastian's approach, which is kind of like... Um, I wish my approach could be more like that, but I trade in the stock market and that's my main thing. And mm -hmm. the most value is real time. Yes. So right now. if I want to be the most value to the person that is just getting started, then I need to be there every day. Is there a way that I can kill two birds with one stone where I can provide real time value? And then on top of that, strategically plan for very effective videos that can gain a lot of traction a huge area of opportunity for my channel. I wish I could upload once a week a video that would align more like Graham Stephan or like Sebastian. No question about it. I'm never going to say that my approach is, is better than anyone else because it's definitely not. But if then you also calculate, okay, well, if he takes weeks to plan one video and let's say the video gets 300,000 views, well, I get 250,000 views every 24 hours. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's because I've uploaded so many videos that at that point, if I go two weeks without uploading. Right. I mean, we're talking at, at that point for me where we'd be 
clearing millions of views, right? Yeah. And it, it, it ends up going back to, well, what is my intention? What is my focus? And my focus is to provide real-time value for people that are trying to get started in the stock market. That is my main focus. I know from learning from Graham and, and seeing people like Sebastian, they kill it with those entertainment-based quality videos that they, ov- that they upload maybe once or twice a month. I think that's beautiful. I think it's a beautiful setup. I, I don't see why you can't do both. Mm-hmm. That's the way that I see it. I know that they probably would not want my approach because it means that they have to show up every single day. Yeah. But because I'm showing up every day, it also doesn't mean that I can't plan ahead and w- for one of my weekend videos when the stock market's close that I can once a week or once every other week have a day in life or something that aligns as motivation yep. or more viral style content. So um, I would I would kind of ask yourself, well, what's the reason that you're uploading content? And if you're if the reason that you're trying to provide or, or upload content is based off of entertainment and stuff like that, then I do think like scarcity or, or once in a while videos like when Mark Rober uploads his once a year like glitter bomb video millions of views every single time right yeah i don't know if you've seen that guy. i have no idea who you're talking about he's, but the, he's the guy that like puts like glitter bombs um gifts and then if someone steals it then it blows up and it throws like oh i've seen video i don't know I, maybe i have seen that yeah yeah i know what you're talking he about he like gets i mean he's huge uh he's one of the biggest on youtube and he uploads one of those videos a year mm-hmm. and it's kind of like well you know because they're so special and so limited there's the scarcity idea behind it where, like, of course I'm going to watch that. But if you were to upload that every single day, every single week, you know, it would get old. So I, I respect both sides of things. I just know because of what my focus is, my thing is I need to provide value in real time every day. And an area of opportunity where I can get better is to be more like Sebastian and like Graham and like the um, seasonal YouTubers that get a lot of views per one video every right. every two weeks. Super interesting. And, and from a statistics standpoint do you know off the top of your head what your channel's rpm is what my channel's what rpm is like how much do you make per thousand views do you know what that oh, number cpm is? cpm R- isn't it called rpm and revenue is it? rpm is the total cpm is what i get paid oh i had it reversed uh rpm Just curious. i was like are you talking about you're like the redlining? rpms <laughs> i can look it up Finance channels have to be a little bit higher. Last time I checked, right? Yeah, finance channels generate higher, and I'm just curious because you're you're doing how many views a month? So we average, I think, around 1.8 to 2 million. Wow, it's incredible. Let's see. It says 25.07. Wow. So, and it's just, I mean, so when you compare that to a um, entertainment channel, like a Mr. I Beast, I'm sure he's like well, a couple bucks, right? No, Mr. Beast is, is different. Mr. Beast different. is built different. Yeah, but I would say any it's average. Built. So uh, sorry, an average guy. An average entertainer. I've seen it firsthand, yeah, where yeah. Um, I have friends that are influencers and that are on and get hundreds of thousands of views. Oh, significantly more than me. And I make more than them on YouTube. Mm. Um, and I get maybe one-tenth of the um, views that they do, um, all the couple channels. You just have to think of, right, you uh, you obviously understand the idea behind it, but for those that don't, why would an entertainment-based channel make less? It's because if you're watching it for entertainment, you're normally younger and less willing to or less likely to spend more money on whatever it is that you are watching, right, because you're watching it for entertainment. Uh, but if you're on a finance channel, I remember crypto when they allowed crypto ads, those people were making like $40, $50 per thousand views. That's what yeah. I was hearing. I mean, I was never a part of that, but um, they were killing it. They were yeah. raking it in. And you have to think, if you're watching a crypto video and then a uh, crypto platform of crypto.com, you know, download this app, of course they're going to w- be able to pay more because you're worth more to them and you're more likely to purchase it because you're not just watching it to have fun, you're watching it because you're someone more accessible or have more access to money and more likely to pull the trigger on signing up for their platform. Yeah. So what are you at? I don't know. What am I at? Hmm. Yeah. 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 19 to 24, but it's like on a, let's let's call it what it is, like 20,000 views a month or something, right? Oh, 
We're cooking in the big world chips. I like that. We're trying. Um, so I wanted to switch gears now. How um, – I'm going to go down the fatherhood path. Yeah. So I'm, I'm interested from your perspective. How old are you, by the way? I'm 28. 28. Yeah. Okay, I'm 27. So how has that changed um, your day-to-day? Uh, maybe it's your mindset. What does that look like? How does that change you? I feel like I have more of a purpose. Um, hmm. I I give myself more of a reason on why I like to slow down and to kind of like smell the rose. Like it is insane to me when I get home and like I see my little daughter and she gets so excited to like see me. And I'm yeah. telling you again, it's very easy for me to say, obviously, and and people might not take it to heart. But I'm telling you that like if you're a dad or your mom right now and, and you know and understand the pride and the joy of what it's like to like see your kid. Like, doing well in business is, is, like, it feels really, really good. But it does not compare, at least in my experience. Mm-hmm. Um, it is, I mean, I don't party as much as I used to. That was a really big thing for me and my friends. Like, we used to party, well, you know, right? We used to party pretty hard uh, because I didn't start partying until I was 23. So I was already doing well when then I began to, like, start drinking and stuff like that. Um, and then I met Rachel. We partied a little bit, and then we found out she was pregnant, and then we were like, okay. Um, it was, c- I was, I was really happy. Uh, I felt like I wasn't young anymore at the time. Uh, I didn't feel like it necessarily. I, I was, like, I was ready for that next chapter in my life where all I can ever say and is anything, any time that I have any doubt, any time that I have any uncertainty, like it, it always trickles down to like the reason I'm doing and wanting to work so hard now. Like I have more of a purpose than I yep. ever have had before. Um, and I, and I really do enjoy it. Wow. That's super cool. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, from a outlook perspective, like what is, I mean, obviously now you have a bigger why, but like, what are your next steps when you plan this thing out? I mean, obviously we talk about cars and jets and everything, but do you plan to do YouTube till you're 55? I mean, like, like what is your goals? When do you, yeah, or do like, you stop? I know that's a weird question, but yeah. Most guys say no, and if you ask me the same question, absolutely yes, I'll stop. I, I, I want to enjoy at some point. Yeah, I mean, because I have to wake up at before market open every day, and yeah. then now I've been trying to like pick up these habits of like going on runs even before it. So like, oh, do I want to wake up at six a.m. every morning for the rest of my life? Uh, no, but I feel like I'm still in that hustle mode. My daughter's really young, and um, I'm still planning trips, and that's something that Rachel does very well um, in our relationship. Is she always reminds us that without her and I, there is no, like, family. Um, as in, like, her and I, as in Rachel and I, because mm-hmm. sometimes I focus so much on the baby, or she does too. So um, I, I feel like I have a pretty good balance of my work life, where it's still a little bit more work than it is spending time all the time with my family. But um, I, I just really still enjoy it. I would say that I, I do not expect myself to continue to do this, forever but i think that one is once it begins to feel more like work then yes You'll but know. i know that when i take trips i look forward to market open on monday i look forward to working with my lvp team i look forward to um working with my tech Buds team at the hq like like and obviously just like today i i felt a little under the weather i told you before we started um and today was a little bit harder and stuff like that and just like anything well that's just like any yep. job, right? Um, but as of right now, I still feel like I have that fire that is like just still lit inside of me where I really do enjoy what I do every day. And until that is no longer there, then I'll stop. Okay. And and, and from an angle perspective, like what do you think your path of focus is? You mentioned you got rental properties. Like what's the, I guess let me rephrase that. What's your ideal plan to continue to build wealth? Yeah. So Nick has big, been a big influence for me. So Nick's my business partner for the house flips. Um, and respectfully, like, I make significantly more than him. But although that's the case, in the two years that he's been my partner, he's acquired six or seven rentals. And I don't have six or seven rentals. And he's been a huge motivation for me. And I, I love that about him. 
that it's made me aware that, you know, you're right. I'm not going to want to work like that for the rest of my life. And yes, I might have these different ventures and I could always invest, but it would also be nice to have some form of passive income, right? Mm -hmm. And something that I can pass down to my family. So that is why we've been entertaining more of the idea of kind of these um, Airbnbs or short-term rentals or long-term rentals. And that's kind of what I'm building with him as of now. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, even for me, the, the, the end of the year play or early next year is our first apartment complex. Nice. Multiple doors, you know, because you can... Here in Arizona? Maybe. Okay. Probably. The, so the guys that I flipped, um, or I guess we're still, it's a three-year flip. I mean, yeah. this is, and then the lady bought it and got under contract and came in and people that are buying a house for $15 million, it's a whole different breed of person. Like they basically, the whole thing needed to be gutted to yeah. redo the, the plan. So it delayed us. Um, and in the meantime of that, they went and found their, I don't know if it's eight or 16 doors in Tucson, and it's done extremely well. I love it. And that. so then, you know, take and it up a notch. Did you learn notch. that from them, or was that, were those your learn, partners? Learn what? The 18 to 20 doors. Yeah, yeah, from them. I mean, they just went and tried. I wasn't in, I'm not in that one in Tucson. Okay. They just went and tried it, and then it's just kind of like... It opened your eyes. I just watched them because I met them at an open house. I didn't know who they were. Your partners for that yeah. fifteen million dollar. Yeah, I just met them at an open house, and they came here in 2016, 2017 with fifty thousand dollars and that and a dream, and then they went from that to like their first two condo flips. To then we bought that for like us investors put like and got it under contract for, and they've just flip 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 flip. That's flip. and I love things like that because it makes it apparent to people. People always think like with my business partners that it was always something so formal or I've known them for life and for for other people to be able to hear that like you met these two random people. They're not formal at all. Yeah, I mean, super unformal. Like, right? To the point where I didn't really know them. And then he was telling the story on my podcast. He gets a call from his, I don't know who called him. He says it on my podcast. Somebody called him and was like, you just got a wire. What do you mean I got a wire? Yeah, this guy named Patrick Kenny's like, oh, shit, he sent money? And I didn't know him. They just said, hey, if you want to be in the – we're we're, uh, we're in a hangar, by the way, guys, so it's a little loud out here. Um, and they just said, hey, you want to be in a flip? And I think they didn't know that I would – yeah. I Because it was, again, if I lose the money, yeah. I still learned how they did a flip. Like, I got to see the contracts. I got to see how they put it together a syndication. That's not easy. Yep. So that, you know, from an educational standpoint, I'm just sharing because, you know, my end goal is just, is, is, is doors. Uh, just at the point where I can have enough passive income to not have to, um, I don't want to say not have to worry. We're always going to worry, but yeah. it covers all your bases. You're good to above and beyond extents, you know. And well, then let you me ask do- you, what is your goal? I mean, you're, if you're going to be buying 18 to 20 doors, hopefully by the end of this year, you're 27. Do you have, do you have, because when people ask me that question, I feel like that point that I'm not very prepared because. No, I always feel unprepared. Yeah. I don't don't have a spinning. Yeah. I don't have like, I want to own or be worth this much by this age. Um, So let me ask you, like, do you have a a goal or an age where either you want your passive income or how many doors do you want to own that provide you a specific amount of income? Yeah. 35. You want to be 35? I want to be 35, so that gives me eight more years, and I want to have between 75 and 100000 a month in passive income. So and what would that require for doors? Well, interesting question, because the it's not going to require as much as you'd think yeah. if they do what they did in Tucson again. Okay. So like that deal, to give you reference, each investor... I don't, I'm going to have to call him and see if we can, ble- if we have to bleep this out. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> Each investor put it. Okay. And it was shot. They had to go through the whole, they got a construction loan, then they refied it. They got their cash out. There's still cash flowing. Okay. Almost a month cash flow and your originals already out is like letting me realize how much more attainable it is. Even yeah. if it's only throwing in. You know, my first deal, I'll probably give them between three to five hundred thousand. Because again, you got to kind of still test, even though I've seen them prove it. Yeah. Test. Okay. Give them three hundred. It's different. I don't know. Three hundred to give me what? If they do that sort of deal, eight to twelve thousand a month net income. Yep. I live a very, 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 very 
simple life. My mortgage is 1800 bucks. Cars are paid for. He's the most expensive part of my life is having full-time video guy assistant. So like I, yeah. outside of like four grand a month, I don't, you know? Yeah. So from a door perspective, how many doors? I don't know the answer, but 35, I want to be done. I like that. Not done in the aspect of I have no purpose, but done in the aspect of now I'm very selective and I just, if I want to shoot a YouTube video, I'll shoot one. If I want to exactly like go, so I, I, you were saying trips. I, I haven't been on a trip No. since I graduated high school, went to Maui and that was the last time I took a trip where I wasn't, I didn't have a, you know, yeah, I go to like Miami, but I went to Miami on Friday afternoon and then flew back Saturday afternoon, literally went to Miami for a dinner. Like that's not a trip. Yeah. I you know, you. so. I, I, I'm, I'm envious of like slowing down at some point. Definitely. I like that. Um, I'm actually taking a trip to Honolulu, uh, with two other couples. Yeah. Uh, the two business partners that I've have for Karsten and more. Um, so we're doing a couple's trip and it was random. We found a really good deal on an Airbnb, really good deal on flights and Rachel loves to travel. So, um, we're just like, yeah, let's do it. It costs like $658 for five. What airline? Nights. Or this is for the airline. Oh, that was for, what uh, airline though? The f- airline is so we booked our flight there. We haven't booked it back because I use this app called Skip Lagged. Oh yeah, heard I've of heard it? of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Skip Lagged actually. Um, I met a guy here in Arizona that got banned from a certain airline because. Oh of yeah, it. you can get banned through any airline. Like I've <laughs> I've been threatened to get banned off of American Airlines because I've used Skip Lagged. Where, uh, for those that are unaware, it's like an abandoned flight. Um, application. So let's say um, that I want to fly to Phoenix. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm sorry. Let's say I am in Phoenix, but I want to fly to LA. But if that flight, let's say, might cost me $180, a direct flight, American Airlines. But American Airlines also has another flight that has a layover in LAX, but its final destination is in Las Vegas. But that flight's only $90. Yep. You just get off. The idea would be you just get off. You just travel with a backpack, as I always do, and you just get off. Yeah, I didn't realize it was a big deal until the guy was like, I literally can't fly right now. No, because it's, they stop you, and they're like, well, if you don't actually end up getting off at your destination, you know that we're going to blacklist you. It's like, do you want to continue with this flight? It happened to me when I was flying back from Tulum. And I told them, I was like, no, yeah, I, I am going to Philly. Mm-hmm. Like, well, you came from Arizona. And I was like, I have, I have a YouTube channel. I'm filming with another YouTube content creator in Philly. What's the issue? It's like, well, you're going to get blacklisted if you don't get onto that flight. And who's telling you this? The, um, the lady check-in that's lady? checking me in, yeah. And they'll, they'll also do a thing where they hmm. won't let you check in online, and they'll make you go in Uh-oh. person. And it's like being called to the principal's office. Yeah, and then they'll try to check you. They'll try to, like, figure out if, if you're actually going to try to go there, which is baffling to me because at the end of the day, like, the flight's going to go there. No one booked that ticket. And I always book it last minute. It's not like I book like months in advance. Like, yeah, that'd be a little bit more messed up. But no, I always book my flights like to like the bu- flight I'm going to book uh, back from Honolulu. I haven't even booked yet. My flight there is a direct flight through American Airlines. And that one cost, um, I think, like $260 and like $60 one way per person. You just love finding deals. Dude, of course. What a deal guy. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn this podcast upside down here. As we round it out, there's one more topic I want to talk about. Let's do it. Chat GPT. Oh, man. I want to talk about AI in general, and I've listened to a handful. I haven't heard your opinion yet. A handful of opinions on it. Some people are love it. Some people are using it. Some people are scared of it. I'm just curious what your thoughts are, and are you implementing it to utilize it in your business or anything of that nature? No. So, all right. Chat GPT. Um, I learned about it from our guys. So they, they're like, there's this AI software that's like insane. People are like, oh, it's scary. I, I don't get scared by any of that stuff. Um, I feel like it, it was a moment where I, when I experienced it, I feel like it, if you could go back to the first person that ever saw maybe like a plane fly, I feel like that's what it was. Mm. Like it, it was, it was actually like, it felt innovative. Like when I felt like my uh, Tesla Model X, actually autopilot for the first time and change lanes like that that was a very surreal moment for me yeah. that's what i feel about chat gpt uh, do i feel like it could be scary maybe I, I don't know enough about it so like i'm probably the dumbest person that you are asking for an opinion for when it comes down to this i know i've thought about it to write 
a very endearing Valentine's letter to my girl. <laughs> Exposed. Yeah. <laughs> Clip that. <laughs> <laughs> but think. Uh, but I, I was testing it out, and I was like, I wonder if it could do it, and it. It does, and it it can do those things where I've also um, heard Jordan Peterson, I think, talk about where, like, it it wrote a very, like, well-written letter that it got graded to a specific, like, SAT score or something like that. I think that's super impressive. I think it's it's insane that technology is there. I don't know why there always has to be this, like, sinister thing about technology. I just feel like we live in a world today where now when anything or any form of improvement is ever done, there's always such a big backlash to try to hold it back because uh, of what it can be. And I feel like if we always continue to think that way, there will never be ever any form of innovation. And I think that is more scary than nothing at all. Well, I think it's just people are fearful that it'll become better than they are. That's not very hard. At their own thing. Yeah, that, you're honest. right. Yeah, I I tested it recently on a referral agreement, and instead of you know texting my attorney to make a referral agreement, because he's going to find, probably find a template anyway, I just made the referral agreement, sent it. Hey, I wrote this. Can you see how I did? He only <laughs> changed. He only changed one little section, and then he added one little line. And he's like, "Really well done." And you know, I I don't I don't have a attorney on retainer per se yeah so just per agreement and i didn't get charged to make an agreement i got charged for him to edit that agreement and it cost you know literally under a hundred dollars versus some of his agreements cost you know thousands and thousands of dollars for that is insane yeah so there there have been applications for me and then even last night we had a margin how do i describe this to a guy that doesn't understand solar the margins got squished for our reps to sell in a certain specific installer okay Last night, about 10.30, it happened. Chat GPT, I explained the scenario and said, write this for my reps, and it did. And then I copy and pasted it and sent it via the company email. So it's it, it has helped me in that sense. And the thing that I heard, I can't remember his name. What's that guy's name? Bearded guy. Everybody keeps talking about him lately. Bearded guy now. Him and his wife are, like, polarizing in Vegas. Sorry, Alex Hormozzi. Oh, yeah, yeah. He said, what's not scary is AI. He said... He said, AI learning from humans is what's going on right now. Wait till AI learns from AI. And it starts to compound. I did hear about that, yeah. Or something of, of that nature. I, th- I think anything that is unknown is scary, right? Yeah. And I think it's kind of like when the internet came about and then people can see your location. All of that is super scary because as as humans, you think of the worst because people are capable of it. But I don't think that should ever stray us away from actually working towards a better tomorrow at the end of it i think everything should always be for the greater good at least work towards it i think that's what chat gpt is at least trying to do in my eyes but again i don't know very much about it but based off of what i'm hearing yes can bad be done with it just like anything yeah so to round it out you're talking to a 80 you know the demographic better than me on my channel what is it 80 percent males 90 percent males 18 to 30 what do you have to say to these guys um because I find a lot of them look on the YouTube screen and they feel like you're not a human, you're a, you're a character, or, you know, we, we were able to accomplish things because of X, Y, and Z. What do you say about guys that are just starting from scratch? You know, just pieces of advice, I guess, clippable moments here for your, for your reels, I guess, if you want them. <laughs> if, if there is one tip and you're really just struggling to get started and you want to connect with someone like you know, yourself or, or myself, I would say is how can you be a value for us, right? So knowing more about you, knowing more about me, it's asking that question of digging a little deeper of not just, hey, can you help me, but how and why would we want to help you beyond of, you know, you paying us to help you. The, the real reason is, I mean, you learned about either my trading side of things, you learned about my real estate side of things, you know about Patrick with with your um, solar side of things, right? There's a lot of ways that people, you know, hey, someone might be interested in signing up for a solar plan. I want to potentially be a sales rep for you. That would be like no question. It doesn't matter who you are. I mean, that's going to make money for you. You're Mm going to be able to compensate them. And at that point, you can build the relationship and you actually have a conversation to entertain that's mutually beneficial. I think yeah. that's the biggest thing that I would begin to ask yourself is what are you bringing to the table that isn't just asking for help, but that complements both parties? Love it. Well, first of all, thanks for 
well, thanks for being on the podcast, but having <laughs> us in your, do you have a name for this thing other than the hangar? Like this is uh, like no. the, this isn't the tech, tech bud bay yet or something. There's no name yet. <laughs> no, we we literally, I wish we would come here more often, but we this have This is sick. If I had Thailand. this, I wouldn't care about having an office. I'd be sitting next to a jet playing on a automated ping pong table. Right. We, yeah. we had like one of our Friday. So Fridays are normally the goals of, of to come here and change our workspace and be here and, you know, we could play music through those old theater speakers and stuff yeah. like that. It gets really loud, um, especially on a Friday. But we've been so busy with our giveaway, and uh, that's our main focus right now. Yeah. Well, it's been awesome having you, man. Thank you so much for coming. And yeah. and um, I look forward to hit, hitting you again on, like, episode 60 or something. Let's do it. All right, man. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you.